I'm going to teach you, I'm going to talk to you about something tonight that um, we all need to hear. In a society that is very much a microwave, I want it now and I want it easy society, right? Um, we get angry if we go to McDonald's and it takes longer than five minutes. Amen? And so we want everything now. How many of you are absolutely ecstatic about streaming TV because there are no commercials? I love the fact that Netflix does not make me wait through commercials. Amen? Because I don't want to wait because I want it now. But Father, I want a golden goose and I want it now. Right? We are an instant gratification uh, society. Amen. Amen. But, how, okay, there's, there's a couple of guys in here, and, and for all the, 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 um, the people in the room who do not hunt, you're just going to just lose me right here. I want to talk to you. Just, I'm gonna, you're just welcome to my world for just a second, okay? It's that time of the year. It's the greatest season of the year. Not Christmas, not Thanksgiving, deer season, okay? Jesus died to give us deer season. Amen. Okay. Y'all okay tonight? Yeah. Everybody just keep frowning and we'll do it that way. Okay, now listen. So, so no, but deer season is amazing. I love it, right? And so in the world of a hunter, right? In the world of a hunter, we will spend Carter, uh, Aaron, uh, all these guys, we will spend money and time. You hunt? Okay. Any other, any other ladies in the house that actually like to kill deer? Okay, good. Okay, good. Amen. Praise God. You're a rare breed. Okay, good. Now, now we will spend money. We will spend time. We will spend effort. We will sit in the rain and the wind. You're at home wearing your fuzzy socks, and there's a fire, and you're underneath a blanket, and you got a book and hot cocoa. We're out there in the rain and the wind. We're bundled up. We're miserable. Our toes are hurting. And we're waiting, and we're going to do it for hours. That doesn't even mention the fact that before we ever got to that scenario, look at me, before we ever got to that scenario, we spent hours, days, preparing the place, cutting limbs, feeding corn, mowing, the, mowing I mean, setting up, scouting. Back in the old days, before they had cameras, people would actually sit there to watch and see how the deer are moving before they actually go hunt the deer to see how they're moving. Back in the good old days. Some of y'all have never hunted that way before. And so we would do all these things. It's preparation, preparation, preparation. Right now, my, one of my favorite TV shows that I'm watching is, this, is, 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 a, is just a manly show called Meat Eater. Anybody ever seen Meat Eater? I love the show Meat Eater. It's about this guy, and he hunts... Uh, he hunts animals, and he likes. To, and he talked about how to cook them, and, he, and he's hunting. And a lot of his hunting he does is in the west, okay? And so if he's on an elk hunt out west, he's sitting on a hillside. And he's overlooking a huge valley, and he can see over onto the next ridge, and he will sit there with a, 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 a tripod and some binoculars, and, a, and, a, and he will sit there in one spot for hours on end, just glassing and looking on the hillside. Until at one point, he's going to see something. He's going to see an elk, and he's going to get up, and then he's going to navigate mountainous terrain. He's going to walk down the mountain, walk through the valley, sneak around the backside, downwind, going to climb up the mountain. He's going to crawl on his belly the last few hundred yards and set up to hopefully see this animal again and, and, and uh, harvest his animal. What's your point? When it comes to hunting, you sit in a stand for hours and hours and hours for what will take seconds or a few minutes to happen. You sit there, you see a deer coming out, you start your timer, okay? And from the time that that deer comes out to the time that it is uh, no longer living, at most takes a few minutes, right? The shot. But you, you look through a scope just for a few, a few seconds, a few minutes, and then you make your kill. Amen. You have spent, listen, you have spent countless hours 
of time waiting and waiting and waiting and sitting and spending money and buying gadgets and throwing out corn and spending time cleaning all for a few minutes of harvesting. Are y'all following me yet? People will pay thousands of dollars to travel all over the world to wait for hours for a few seconds of harvesting. Those people aren't crazy. Those people are amazing. <laughs> okay? So what's your point, Pastor Chester? What are you preparing for what are you spending time on? What are you spending your life on for that one moment that makes everything make sense? For instance, this guy who's sitting across there, he's hunting an elk, right? He's hunting an elk. He's going to sit there for hours. He has spent a year planning this trip. He's got a guide. They have talked on the phone several times. He's flown to his destination. He spent days sitting, days waiting, hours hunting. He, he spends another hour traveling through the terrain, getting up for a few moments of making his kill. He's going to walk up. He's going to, but first of all, after all that waiting, he's going to make a shot. And then what's he going to do? Wait some more. Because if you run after that deer, if it's wounded, that elk is wounded, it's going to keep running and keep running, and you made your life miserable. So after all the waiting, and he finally got his shot, he has to sit down and force himself to wait and to think things like, was that a good shot? Was that a, was that, did, I, did I hit him too high, too far back? Did he, did he hunker down? Did he hop up? Right? If a deer hunkers down, that's not good. If he hops straight up when you hit him, that's good. If he falls straight down, that's even better. Okay? And, say, so you, and you're analyzing everything. Which way was the wind blowing? Which way did he go? And you're just, I mean, you're sitting there and you're painstakingly waiting for at least another hour. Just sitting there. Just riveted. And then finally, you're going to begin slowly walking. And you're going to find where you shot that animal. And you're going to find blood. And you're going to start tracking very slowly the blood. And then you're going to crest over a hill. And you're going to see it laying down there. How many of you have been hunting before? How many of you am freaking you out right now? If, if you're online and you're one of those... Uh, uh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> and so you're going to keep walking, and you're going you're gonna to track that animal. When you see it down there, and your heart goes, oh, it's laying down. And you walk up to it, and, and it's laying there. And, and then every hunter does this. They take the rival, and they poke it. <laughs> right? How many of y'all have poked the animal? Like, okay, good. And you just poke it. What do you poke it for? To see if it jumps up. <laughs> because that's what we want to do. It poke something to see if it jumps up while we're standing right on top of it, okay? Okay, and so, and so poke it, it's dead, and then here comes what every man dreams of in this elk hunt, what every hunter dreams of in this elk hunt. He puts his bow down, he puts his gun down, whatever he's hunting with, and he reaches over and he grabs those antlers, and he holds, the, and he holds it up. I mean, what I'm talking about. And he holds it up. All those hours, all that time, all that energy, all that money was all, all come, come crashing together in that one moment where he held that prize. Now, for most of us, that sounds crazy. Listen, when he was sitting there glassing three or four hours earlier, it's snowing, the wind's blowing. He's miserable. His toes are cold. Right? He's shivering. When he's holding those antlers, he's thinking, this is the best weather ever. Right? All the discomforts of the weight were now the perfect backdrop of the success. I'm fixing to start preaching. Are with me? Now when he tells the story years later, man, it was blizzard out there. And it just makes the whole conversation even better. There's a story in the Bible we're going to read. It's in uh, Genesis 29. Let's read it together. 
Jacob was in love with Rachel. Raise your hand if you've ever been in love. Okay, we got marriage problems in the church. Jacob was in love with Rachel. He told his father, he told her father, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel to be my wife. <laughs> Raise your hand if you love your spouse long enough to work for seven years. Missy. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay. Good. okay. <laughs> All the married people are like, I don't want to lie in the house of God. <laughs> right? Seven years he's going to, he's going to, now listen, I don't want to get crude. I know there's some kids in here. But he's not thinking about growing old and 50-year anniversary. He's thinking about the night that it all comes together. How do you know that? Because he says it essentially. In the, in the, Agreed, Laban replied. I'd rather give her to you than anyone else. Stay and work for seven years for me. Okay? Verse 30. No, 20. Jacob worked seven years years. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I mean, this is not like the fairy tale Bible story. Can you imagine what year two, uh, uh, October of year two must have been frustrating? Come on, help me tonight. Talk to me. Can you imagine year five, January 17th? It's been five years and 17 days, 23 hours and 10 minutes, and I can't sleep. Right? One day in, in, in Jacob's diary, Rachel was mean to me. I'm not sure I want to keep doing this. Come on, help me out. Seven years. And then all of a sudden something starts to shift. Six years into it, only 364 days left. Two weeks before, I can hardly contain myself. The night before, for six years, 364 days, I had proven my love for this woman. Next day, he wakes up, puts on his tuxedo, goes to the, goes to the ceremony. I don't, I don't know what kind of ceremony they had. Apparently, he was not responsible with alcohol. He goes to sleep that night. Let's, well, let's just read it. Jacob worked for seven years. Finally, the time came for him to marry her. I have fulfilled my agreement. Jacob said to Laban, now give me my wife's so that I can spend 50 years. No. He, he had a moment in mind. Come on, people. He had a moment in mind, right? He said it. He had a moment in mind. All seven years, he had a moment in mind. That's how life works, if we will think about it. Verse 21. Verse 20, uh, so Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. Verse 23, that night when it was dark, must have been very dark, moonless, starry, unstarry night, Laban took Leah to Jacob. Verse 24, Laban had given Leah a servant. Okay, verse 25, when Jacob woke up in the morning, he went, huh? <laughs> what, 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 doth my eyes deceive me? And this is where the story gets crazy, as if it wasn't crazy enough before. This is where it's just like, dude, there's a lot of fish in that big old sea. Right? No. What does he do? He went to Laban and said, I've worked for seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? Verse 26. It is not our custom here to marry off the younger. Verse 27. Wait until the bridal week is over, and then I'll give you Rachel. If, if you'll stay seven. Now, some of y'all wouldn't raise your hand for seven years. Raise your hand if, you'll, if, you will, if you love your spouse enough to spend 14 years to work for their complete betrothal. Thank you for helping me, Missy. Hmm. 
You didn't raise your hand? Um, my hand, I was just sitting there doing this. <laughs> Don't fight in front of the kids, Missy. Okay, listen. <laughs> All right. 14, look at me, 14 years he invests into one moment. Chester, why are you talking about this? Because too many times, look at me all across this room, too many times we'll give up on a dream. We'll give up on something that our heart desires because it got too hard and the long was too wait. The, the wait was too long. Right? We'll give up because, because we grew impatient. We give up because we grew impatient. We give up because we grew tired. We grew weary. We, 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 we thought that there was another avenue for quicker success. Come on, help me tonight, please. We give up. We give up. We stop what we're doing. We don't keep persevering. And I'm telling you, what the Bible teaches us is absolutely contradictory to our culture, which is instant gratification. This started in my mind. Uh, I, I've been thinking about this, but, but, but yesterday I was interviewed by the school district of El Dorado. I am volunteering to be a mentor to two little boys fourth grade boys that I've, I've chosen to, look at me, I've chosen to spend one hour a week with those boys until they graduate high school. And she had me on camera and she said this question, why are you doing this? And I said this, I have a picture, look at me, I have a picture of one day standing in the corridor, standing in the corridor of the, uh, of the auditorium, of the, of, of the uh, stadium, and watching those two young men come around the corner after they've been dismissed off the field. And the boys are this big now, but they're this big then, and giving them the biggest bear hug and congratulating them and thinking to myself, I had a small part and seeing this moment happen. But you, what you don't understand is that moment is going to be eight years in the making. That moment takes every Tuesday at 2 o'clock for an hour to make it happen. And at some point, I'm going to think to myself, I'm a big shot. I'm too busy. I don't have time. Somebody else can do it. And at some point, if I don't persevere, be consistent, remain faithful, I'll exchange a moment of a lifetime for lots of little moments of instant gratification of doing what I want to do. And this is the, uh, I don't, don't want to be, like, this is the American way. This is the, this is the Western culture way of as long as I remain comfortable, I'm happy but really what doesn't make us happy is, the, is the, all the little moments of comfort. What makes us happy is, is having a few defining moments in life that we had to work our tail off to get to. Of all the moments of comfort, it's like, it's, like, it's, like, it's a doctor who went through eight years of medical school, long nights to, to, to achieve a dream. It's, 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 you see what I'm saying? And my question to you is, in your spiritual walk, in your natural walk, uh, uh, in your life, anything that you're dreaming of, anything that, you, that God's put on your heart. See, I think God put a love for Rachel in Jacob's heart that he loved her to the point it was a 14-year uh, commitment to work. Not to lay around on the couch and play more Xbox, but to toil in the field for her. His harvest was wrapped up in a woman that he still had to, to, to work the field. Come on. Okay. And my question is, what are you persevering through? What are you putting one foot in? What are you hunting that you will sit in miserable conditions in one spot for eight straight hours, glassing the side of a mountain just for the chance and whenever you get to hold those horns, that's the day everything went right. Most days, everything doesn't go right. 
What are you fighting for, believing for? What are you having to persevere through? What do you love enough that you'll lay down your life to see it happen? There's another scripture in uh, Galatians 6. It's a good scripture. Let us not get tired of doing what is good. Look at me. Look at me. Maybe you're believing for the salvation of a son or a daughter, a brother, a sister, a child. Tell me how many prayers is enough before you say, That's too, I'm, I'm, I'm done now. Right? How many hours is too many hours spent? Right? In your heart, at day one, when God burdened you, for that salvation of that person, you spent time on the floor with tears rolling down your face, full of faith and full of excitement. What happened at day 35? What happened at day 435? Are y'all with me? Because there's a honeymoon season to all our dreams. There's a season when it starts off that we are so full of faith. Man, I'll believe for anything. I can bust through the walls of hell. I can do this. Nothing's going to stop me. And walls never stop us. Time stops us. The long journey slows us down. Man, I'm preaching way better than your job. My point to you is, is, is we don't get frustrated in the first hundred days. We get frustrated in the hundred days that lead up to the, what we want to see. But in your mind, you had a vision on day one of holding them in the altar of your church, holding them in the bedroom, grabbing them and tears rolling down their face as they've cried out to Jesus and repented. And you let that vision, you let that mind, that, that moment engulf you into believing it was possible. And see, without a vision, people, they quit, they perish, they stop. You've got to fuel the vision of what you saw on day one and make it, such as pow- make it, uh, it, it equally as powerful on day 1001. Amen? Are you with me? Let us not get tired. I have heard this phrase. A million times lately, I'm tired. Guess what? Take a number. Right? Raise your hand if you're tired. (laughs) I don't even remember what I'm tired about anymore. I'm just tired. Right? We're all tired. Everybody's tired. Everybody's busy. Everybody's going. And that's okay. Look, we get that way. There is a need for natural rest. Somebody say amen. Amen. I plan on resting on a deer stand, amen. Sitting back there in the quiet, no cell phone service. I plan on sitting there with my feet up, and I may even fall asleep. And the Lord said it was good. Rest is fine. What's not fine is giving up. What's not fine is getting tired of doing what is good. I've heard people say, well, I prayed for 15 years. And I want to say, I want to say, Jacob worked for 14 years, right? Jesus walked the earth for 33 and a half years for one moment he was sent to accomplish. For one moment he was sent to accomplish. It wasn't the cross, it was the resurrection, the cross was, the fear of going to the cross was what was going to keep him to go into the resurrection. That's why in the garden he's saying, God, if there's any other way. But the only way to resurrection was through the cross. Yeah. You hearing me? It's not the fact that Jesus died that says it's the fact that he rose again. Many martyrs have died in the name of religion, but only one has rose again. So Jesus, in that garden, says, 
one more day I can fulfill your will. And that day felt like it went on forever, I'm sure. Amen? One more step, I can walk up this mountain. One more, one more lash I can take. One more punch, one more pluck, one more, one more nail. And he wouldn't stop and he wouldn't give up. Right? He fulfilled. He lived 33 and a half years to go into hell, plunder hell, take the death, the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And he lived 33 and a half years to do this. That one moment when he raises from the dead, one moment when he comes back to life, all 33, when, when God takes on the filth of humanity, takes on the stench, the body odor, God never smelled his armpits until Jesus came to the earth, Right? He takes on the filth of humanity, the brokenness of humanity. For 33 and a half years, God becomes a man, which, by the way, was a downgrade. And for 33 and a half years, lives in that funk of humanity to open his eyes in victory and resurrection. My Bible tells me he was tempted in every way we are tempted, which means to me I'm tempted to quit sometimes. So Jesus was tempted. He knows what it is to want to say, I want to tap out. But he knows what it is to persevere and push through it as well. Are you all with me tonight? Okay, good. So let us not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. There is coming a moment. Y'all hearing me? Like, this makes me happy. Like, if don't stop doing good. There is coming a moment. There's coming a period of time. There's coming, even if it lasts for a second. Right? There's coming just a moment that will make it all worth it if you just don't quit. If you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't stop trying. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Don't stop putting forth the effort. Don't stop swinging the sickle. Don't stop doing whatever God's called you to do. If you're waiting for whatever it is you're waiting for, you can wait one more day. We've been taught this principle. Listen to me. We've been taught this principle in life that... Uh, if you always do the same thing you've ever done, that's the definition. And don't see different results. That's the definition of insanity, correct? Right? I say that that is true sometimes. I say, on the other hand, the only way to master what you're doing is to do it thousands of times over and over and over and over and over again. Tiger Woods didn't become the greatest golfer in the world because he woke up one morning and said, hey, I ate a Big Mac. It made me the best golfer in the world. It was thousands, thousands of golf balls hit daily doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. I'm tired. I don't want to do this no more. Dad says, get your rear end out there and hit some more golf balls. Over and over and over. Michael Jordan becomes the best basketball player of all times. Hands down, LeBron James ain't got a prayer because Michael Jordan shot. He was the last one in the gym, right? He, he just kept working his crap. I got the flu. I don't care. I'm still going to play in the finals, right? I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop. Let me help. Let me ask you a question. What is it, what excuse is good enough to get you to stop believing for whatever God's put on your heart? What is it? I've heard this. It's unfair. Well, this is what I love about this parable. Some guys come to work early in the morning and some guys come to work right before dark. They both get paid the same. 
And the guys in the early morning say, it's not fair. Did you not work for an agreed price? I can't help it if y'all look around and my brother or sister gets what I've been wanting and chasing for years earlier faster than me. I, I signed up to say yes to him no matter what the cost, no matter how long it took. It's not a competition. It's not a comparison. Actually, it's just a, uh, a, a, a it's, it's will I run the race? Paul said it. Will you run the race, right? Will you fight the fight? Races and fights are not pleasant. Raise your hand if you've been in a fight. Pastor Cleed, you come tell us about it right now. Okay. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, if you've been in a fight, they're not fun. They're not pleasant. You bleed, right? Right? You don't give up. You don't stop. You, you, you keep going. All right, one more scripture. Verse 10, by the way, says, uh, go back to verse 10. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Look at me, look at me. Opportunities are not always the fuzzy feeling and the goosebumps that we see when we're walking down Walmart and the, whole, the angel of the Lord blew up against me and I, they illuminated before me and I walked over to them and I was like, Jesus has sent me today with the gospel of Jesus to save your soul. <laughs> right? Sometimes the opportunity looks boring as all get out. Actually, many times the opportunity is highly inconvenient to you. We should do good to everyone whenever we have the opportunity. Let's just keep preaching because it's going so well. Revelation 2, verse 8 says this. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Smyrna. Smyrna. Smyrna uh, is from the word myrrh. Myrna, Smyrna, Smyrna, Smyrna. Literally, it means something that will give a fragrance once it's been crushed. Right? How many of y'all want to be a sweet Smelling fragrance to the Lord. Holy cow, we need salvation in the house. How many of y'all want to be a sweet smelling fragrance to the Lord? Okay, okay. You do understand the only way the fragrance happens is if it gets crushed first. How many of y'all want to get crushed by the Lord? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. I smell like me when I'm in perfect preservation, but when I allow him to crush me, I begin to smell like him. This message is from the one who is the first and the last who was dead but now is alive. In other words, this message is from one who understands what it was to be crushed but come out on the living side. Oh, I, got the, I got the AG preacher rising up in me right now. I know about your suffering. When he's saying that, the one who was dead but is now, I know about suffering. And your poverty, you are are rich though. I know the blasphemy of those who oppose you. They say they are Jews, but they are not because of the synagogue belongs to Satan. Here we go, verse 10. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Don't be afraid of crushing. Don't be afraid that you're going to have to spend seven years in preparation and work to obtain something you love. And then, oh, by the way, let's do it again. Jesus is the one who says, if they ask you, walk a mile, uh, not just one mile, go with them too. Jesus is all about the long haul. The devil will throw some of you into prison. Let's do it. Right? You will suffer. Uh, excuse me, John, uh, we don't prophesy like that here. We like to give words of encouragement. Um, I prefer that you wouldn't uh, say things like that here and then in this postmodern church where we like fluffy cotton candy for the word of God. You will suffer, but 
if you remain faithful. If you don't give up, if you don't stop, if you just keep putting one front foot in front of the other, if you're in that prison for 10 days and they beat you daily, as long as you don't stop, keep breathing another breath, don't deny me, keep singing praises, keep testifying about who I am, as long as you don't stop. Even in the face of... Now, we like to read this, uh, as, but we, when's the last time any of you faced death for your faith? Jesus is looking at a group saying, your name means fragrance. If you can go through the crushing, you're going to face death. Just don't stop. If you remain faithful when facing death, I will give you a crown of life. And whenever I saw that scripture, crown of life, I pictured myself on the side of that mountain with those antlers in my hands, thinking all that work finally came to fruition in one moment. Look at me. Whenever you get to heaven and he gives you a crown and you hold it in your hand, there will not be a sense of, I wonder if it was worth it. I wonder if the hours of prayer, the hours of the study of the Word of God, I wonder if the countless Sundays I got my hind end out of bed and went to church even when I didn't feel like it. I wonder if all the, uh, the, the drama I had to put up with people and the, and the nagging, and I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if it's going to be, I wonder, I wonder if this is, I wonder if it, it, none of those thoughts went in your mind. I wonder if those days I fasted really paid off. Holding that crown. In that moment, here's what I think you'll think. For this, I could do it all again. In that moment, I think you're going to be like Jacob who looked over and saw Rachel and said, yeah, I can do seven more. If we love, if we have a passionate, burning love for what he's put in our heart. For the dreams. Chester, when will you stop preaching about revival? We've heard this sermon over and over and over. I'm tired of your Brownsville stories. Me too. I'm going to keep telling them. Why? But I haven't yet grabbed the antlers. I haven't yet grabbed a hold of the crown. And I'm not going to quit. And I kind of believe that God's put together a group of people who are in it for the long haul and who's not going to quit because they want to taste of the victory that he has promised. Amen? Stand up on your feet. So Holy Spirit, I pray tonight over your people. Lift your hands if you will. I pray over your people the grace to take another step. The grace to not give up, to keep trying, to not give in. God, they're tougher than they even believe about themselves. Your word says that you will not put on them more than they can handle. God, they're tougher. They've got wider shoulders and stronger backs and sturdier legs than they ever knew. Their skin is more like leather than tissue paper. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give them a burning desire to not quit, to keep on pressing in for whatever you've laid on their heart. For us as collectively as a church... We would not give up on revival, God. We would not give up on the promises. That I know for a fact there's a reason you put me through what you put me through and would not let me be a nominal Christian and do nominal church. Give us all a big old hefty dose of perseverance, the grace to remain faithful. Wherever there is a lack of love, 
I pray that we would be like Jacob's who would fall in love with whatever that prize in our eye is. We would fall in love to go the long haul. For every prodigal, for every person praying for a prodigal, I pray that the vision and the dream of, of their salvation and that moment of hugging them after they have given their heart to Jesus would not die. The dream would remain, that the vision would be reunited in their spirits. For every person in this room who's called to ministry, every person in this room who's called to whatever it is, God, who's been giving a burning desire from heaven, don't lose the vision. God, God, give them the grace to not lose the vision. Resurrect in us some good old-fashioned principles of perseverance and faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.